Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. And this is Rona Palmer from Fluke Excelix. And thanks so much for joining today's best practices webinar. And let me take a moment and just clarify in our best practices webinars, we focus less on specific products, uh, specific software, and more on maintenance strategies and tactics that can really help improve your operations. And we invite guest speakers from a variety of backgrounds to share their expertise. And I'm really pleased to have with me today, Ryan Best, who is a certified level two vibration analyst and a technical sales representative with Prude Technic, who some of you may already know has recently become part of the Fluke Reliability family. And Ryan's going to be presenting today's topic a hard look at Sawfoot, detecting machine frame distortion before it causes major issues. So good morning, Ryan, and hey, thanks for being with us today. Good morning, good afternoon, and thanks for having me here to do this. This is exciting. Yeah, and you know, Ryan, we had uh, quite a strong response to today's webinar. So while people are, we'll give them a moment to log in, maybe you can share with us, you know, you have quite a strong technical background you work with, you're talking to clients all day long, and maybe you can tell us what prompted you to choose this particular topic to speak to today and why you feel it's important. Uh, in my experience, Softfoot is typically a divisive topic um, just because a lot of people, they might be familiar with it, they might not be familiar with it, they might uh, use their best practices when diagnosing it, um, and correcting it, and sometimes they just don't. Sometimes they know better and they don't do it. So it's nice to kind of give the full gamut of information that I have um, in my pocket so that everybody can kind of go forth and, and use it uh, accordingly. Great, and make good decisions. All right, excellent, well, we look forward to it. Um, but before I turn things over to Ryan, a few quick housekeeping items. We are recording today's session, so the phone lines are muted to avoid background noise, but we will save time after the presentation. Ryan has agreed to stay till the top of the hour if needed and answer all of your questions. But please feel free to type the questions into the question feature at GoToWebinar at any time, and then we'll read them to Ryan at the conclusion of his presentation. And if you'd like to receive a PDF of today's slide deck, there'll be a brief survey at the end of the webinar where you can request a copy. All right, so without further ado, let me turn it over to you, Ryan. Thank you. Okay, so a little bit about myself before we go forward. Um, I've been working for Proof Technic for uh, about four years at this point. I started out as a service technician, um, so I do have hands-on experience and I made a transition uh, to product sales and service sales as well. Um, pretty quickly, in fact, I got quite tired of being in trying sections of paper machines. Um, I wanted to kind of get a little closer to every type of industry. Um, I also, uh, like was stated earlier, do have a category two vibration analyst uh, ISO cert. A little bit about Proof Technic. Um, it was founded in 1972. Uh, we are now part of Fluke Reliability, uh, which is the leading maintenance technology manufacturer and solution provider. Um, our motto has always been keep your world rotating. Uh, our, our bread and butter is rotating machinery when it comes to alignment, condition monitoring, or non-destructive testing. Um, that's what we do and that's what we always have done. Recently this year, Fluke uh, acquired us, so we are now all one big happy family. I think before we start, um, it's, it's usually pretty interesting and also helps me go forward uh, when we talk about how often do you guys check for your machinery soft foot. Um, and this, this is where we can kind of start the poll section. Um, the options would be regularly. You know, do you check it when you have time? Do you check it rarely? And some of you just might not be familiar with Softfoot at all, which is fine. Um, that's kind of the whole point of this. Great. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll. And to help get us started, so Ryan knows kind of 
where you are regarding Sawfoot and can tailor his presentation accordingly. And bear in mind, we only share the results in aggregate, no wrong answers here. So just please weigh in and let us know how often you check your machinery for Sawfoot or perhaps you're not familiar. All right, it looks like we've gotten three quarters of the folks swaying in, so we'll leave the polls open a few more seconds here. All right, let's go ahead and share results. So Ryan, it looks like 15% said regularly, 9% are saying when we have time, 40% say rarely, and 37% say I'm not familiar. Interesting. Yeah, that sounds that sounds about right. Um, that that kind of coincides with my findings, uh, you know, with my customers and people out in the field. Um, so that's fine. That makes perfect sense. Um, and this this should be helpful uh, going forward. Okay. Uh, so the first thing that we want to talk about is what is Softfoot. Um, sounds like there's not a lot of familiarity here. Uh, so this would be a good place to start, obviously. So fundamentally, soft foot is the condition when rotating machinery is set in place on its base, frame or sole plate. Uh, one or more than one of the feet are not making good contact at the foot points on the frame. Um, I promise this is the only one I'm going to read word for word. Um, the most common way to describe soft foot in a way that everyone can understand is to compare it to a wooden chair with four legs. When one foot is shorter than the rest, the chair will wobble. Okay, this is slightly problematic. Um, the chair metaphor is helpful on a simple basis, but we're diving deeper into this topic, so it's important to note that a chair or table makes point contact with the floor. All right, if our rotating machinery were only making point contact, uh, every soft foot could be corrected by using three legs like a tripod. With that said, it's important to recognize uh, that our machinery feet are not making point contact, but have four or more ideally flat-footed surfaces uh, that are trying to make, trying to mate with uh, the flat base surfaces. The chance that all surfaces are flat and in the same plane is extremely rare, um, and that's that's what we're going to talk about. Why is it so? Why is soft foot important to understand? Uh, well, you know, if there's soft foot, it would shift the center line of rotation. Something like that can destroy the machine from the inside out. It could also warp the machine. If a machine is tightened to its base with a soft foot condition, the soft the shaft position uh, can change, which ultimately results in a misalignment. It can also provide uh, residual vibration. This will begin to loose uh, the foot bolts over time, which can then lead to the shim packs working themselves out from under the feet. This again results in machine misalignment. So what we're talking about here is this is all going to result in machine misalignment. And this is the this is your first step to aligning. All right, so cyclical fatigue may occur in areas uh, with highly concentrated stress, uh, which may begin to form cracks uh, that then begin to spread along the machine housing. Repetitive impact from the vibrating loose feet um, causes spreading corrosion, potentially damaging both the machine frame and the base. So these are all problems you do not want to encourage. And this is why it's important to understand soft foot. There's four different types of soft foot. Um, two are going to be your main culprits. Um, and then two secondary versions, which one of them is more popular than the other as well. All right. So the first, the first version and probably the most common uh, is going to be something called parallel soft foot. This is, this is when the base plate and the machine feet are parallel to each other. Um, whenever these things are tightened down, the frame distorts um, as it's pulled towards the base, which then happens to throw you into misalignment. Now, this one's easy to correct just by adding shims for the correct thickness. And we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, shims and measuring and all that good stuff once we figure out what soft foot is. Second form of soft foot is angular. Uh, this is caused when the foundation uh, and the machine form an angle with one another. Um, 
as you can see with the illustration, this one might be a little more difficult to diagnose just because it's not flat. And as we know, um, shims are flat, hopefully. And if not, we'll get to it. Squishy foot, which is always my favorite to talk about. Um, it's, it's caused by having either too many shims, um, some corrosion, or debris under the foot. So any, any sort of junk that could, that could accumulate underneath the foot um, happens pretty often, especially if there's been a machine that's been tightened down for quite some time and been running for months or maybe even years before the, the bolts have been loosened. Um, but yeah, this is a common one that you make yourself. This isn't something that you come into um, naturally. Finally, uh, a fourth, fourth type of soft foot is, is something called external force. Uh, this, is, this is caused by such things as uh, pipe strain, sometimes uh, electrical connections, um, or a stiff coupling. As, as we know, there are several different kinds of couplings. Sometimes if there's a really bad misalignment and you, you have a single plane coupling, uh, that, can, that can start to warp your machinery and give you some soft foot. This one's probably the hardest to diagnose. Um, it can also occur at any point. You know, so when you're tightening down or um, doing any sort of installation, this thing can kind of reveal itself. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with pipe strain, uh, without getting too far into the workings of pumps and nozzle loads, pipe strain is caused by the misalignment of the suction and or discharge flange to the corresponding flange on the pump. Um, so if you're looking at that, that pump illustration there, the tube going up, um, if that's not connected properly or if there's any sort of stress, um, that's going to that's gonna influence your machine. Um, and when we talked about electrical, connection, electrical connections, uh, sometimes motor terminals can also provide the same impact. Um, they can get pretty heavy themselves depending on the motor setup. So the causes of soft foot, um, you know, this is kind of in line with you know, why it's, why it's important to understand it, but these also help you think critically uh, when doing your alignment. Um, so warp frame or base plays one of the most prevalent causes to soft foot. Uh, when the machinery is placed on its base, uh, you know, the sole plate or frame, one or more of the feet are not making good contact at the foot points on the frame. This can also be a problem when machining on a smaller scale. Uh, these issues seem to be worse when the bases are fabricated rather than the cast base plates. The chances of making uh, true 45 or 90 degree cuts and welds um, is, is pretty slim. Damaged and cracked foundations, um, that, that's pretty easy to see visually, typically. Um, that's gonna come down to how long, how long that, that, that asset's been sitting there and how rough it's been running. Uh, dirt, debris, and paint under feet. We we kind of touched on that a little bit, um, and we'll get we'll figure out how to fix that. So a lot of times, if you go to to loosen your your bolt on your assets, your rotating machinery, um, a lot of things start to shake free. Okay, so paint, rust, grime, anything that's kind of accumulated over the over the the course of uh, runtime. And what that does is it kind of sneaks underneath the foot and provides more millage, um, and it's not flat. Excessive shimming. Um, dirt. This kind of falls in line with the dirt debris and paint we talked about with squishy foot. Um, we'll learn more about the shimming uh, a little bit later. It's, there's certain rules to follow when shimming your machines, uh, but it's worth mentioning now that using too many shims uh, induces a squishy foot since you're essentially creating a spring. Bent or damaged feet. Uh, this can happen during manufacturing or installation, uh, especially when proper rigging practices are neglected. So, you know, if you're, if you're banging around your machinery before you set it down, these things can happen pretty easily. Grout deterioration is also a problem. Contaminants uh, such as oils, grease, and moisture can kind of beat up grout over time. This leads to the loss of stiffness or strength in the base, then causing warp. Uh, we talked about poorly machined feet or, base, uh, feet or bases quite a bit. 
already, but this falls along the same lines as warping. Um, it's, it's just on a smaller scale. So if the feet and the base aren't machined properly, uh, full contact can't be achieved and promotes a soft foot condition. Pipe strain, we went into that already, but this is just an, you know the external force and influences warp on the machinery or stress. So we know why these things happen, but what do they do to our machinery? All right, so these are these are the effects of soft foot. Uh, most importantly, machine misalignment, uh, which is you know the name of the game for me. My responsibility here uh, is to provide maintenance engineers with the tools they require to keep their rotating machinery aligned and healthy. Uh, whether that be laser shaft alignment devices and services to continuous monitoring solutions on the vibration side of things, uh, this is what I'm here for. So it's a fact that worldwide industry is losing billions of dollars a year due to the misalignment of machinery. Um, with that said, the assumption uh, is that most of the uh, this audience is familiar with uh, machine alignment and its importance since eliminating soft foot should be step one. However, if there is uh, an interest in learning more about alignment, I'm certain we can organize another technical webinar. Um, I'll be giving out my contact information at the end and uh, Hopefully we can begin some sort of relationship with that. Um, the bench shaft is exactly what it sounds like. When the axis of rotation does not meet the axis of the shaft, um, this this leads to changes in shaft position, which then leads to increased load on bearings and the misalignment of bearings, which results in excessive wear on the top and bottom of the outer race of the bearing. Uh, when it comes to soft foot, forces typically act 180 degrees apart. Hopefully that makes sense in the scheme of uh, rotating machinery. So it'll either be top and bottom or left and right. Um, that's where the impact is going to is going to fall on your bearings. High vibration levels are of concern as well. Uh, soft foot provides a rise to a one x harmonic to the rotation frequency in the spectrum. Uh, this is similar. It often looks like looseness or misalignment, which is why soft foot detection is important. Um, once you have your vibration analysis uh, laid out for you. Seal failures are common, um, although soft foot uh, and misalignment compound this, uh, you know, pretty hard. Um, and an increase in power consumption, this is kind of related to more money um, than anything, but an increase in power consumption occurs due to the increased strain and stress on the machinery. Um, these increases can occur for a number of additional reasons, obviously, um, such as coupling type or lubrication. So now that we understand, you know, why these things happen, what the effects on our machinery are, and how, how important it is to kind of figure this out before we start aligning our machinery, um, it's worth talking about how to measure it, okay? So there's several ways to detect and measure soft foot. Um, it's important to employ these methods um, during every machine alignment and installation. So when we talked about that poll question, um, it didn't seem like a lot of people do it every time. Hopefully, the takeaway here um, is that you incorporate it more and more until you start to see the benefits of this. Um, and it makes sense to do it every time. I understand the time is usually limited, um, but in the long run, it's, it's very much worth it. I put together a, a small recommended toolkit. Um, first item is going to be something called a feeler gauge. Um, it's used to measure gap widths or the clearance between two parts. Um, this is a static measurement, right, as the thicknesses of those little pieces are absolute. Um, they consist of a number of small lengths of steel, different thicknesses. Each, each piece is marked. Um, they can be stacked for, you know, in-between values as well, um, since they are flexible. For us here in the United States, these are typically measured in thousands. Um, some companies, some European companies that have places, uh, facilities in North America will still use uh, millimeters. Secondly, a dial indicator. Um, these are used in a number of ways uh, for maintenance, but for our purpose, uh, the dial indicators are going to translate a small linear distance um, or relative position into rotational movement. Um, the primary parts of a dial indicator are the face, the case and the plunger. 
the plunger is a spring-loaded piece there, a uh, little piece sticking down uh, that can be depressed into the case, causing the dial to move clockwise. Uh, this tool can measure movement in real time, whereas the feeler gauge, like we said, can measure non-moving gaps only. Uh, like the feeler gauge, uh, we're going to keep this in thousands um, unless otherwise stated. The third piece is a micrometer or caliper, depending on your terminology. Um, on that picture there, I have a digital version, which is very easy to use. Um, not doesn't require a whole lot of adjustment, and you you can you can read the display quite clearly. Um, so this is this micrometer is a measurement device, uh, like the previous tools, um, but for our process, we're going to use it to measure thickness um, in a different way than the feeler gauge. Uh, we'll take a look at it in a little bit when it comes to shimming, um, but this is the most pain-free version. Is the is the digital version you see on the screen there? Um, we'll also be using that in thousands. Fourth piece, fourth and fifth are kind of like housekeeping. Um, there's not a whole lot of uh, engineering behind these, but uh, a wire brush is going to allow you to clear any debris or corrosion you come across. Um, when we talk about squishy foot, it's nice to have something that clears all that that junk out. Um, cleaner or degreaser, um, you're going to want to use this to accompany your wire brush. This allows you to clean the existing shims um, and the contact surfaces when you're doing your soft foot correction. Um, in my experience, brake cleaner is the best bet, um, but I have also had success with stuff like uh, crud cutter or simple green. Before we go any further, uh, I want to put this out here that the soft foot tolerance you're, be, you're going to be looking for is two thousandths. Um, this is the max tolerance when it comes to soft foot. The absolute maximum soft foot measurement you can have under a foot is two thousandths. Okay. Uh, this is regardless of method or machinery, and it's the industry standard across the board. Um, what that means might make a little more sense when we look at some feet here. So. I took some time to photograph how each of these tools are used. Uh, please bear with me since I was relegated to using a simulator rather than actual machinery. Um, to measure each foot properly, each foot must be measured independently. Um, so when we're talking about our two in our two thousandths tolerance, uh, if you look at how that feeler gauge is sitting underneath that foot, that's that's the gap. We're going to shoot for two thousandths or less. All right. So with that said, that's how you would use a feeler gauge to measure for soft foot. All right. Once the bolts are loosened, uh, you want to check for gaps using the feeler gauge as seen above. It's always important to remember that checking all the way around the feet um, are going. It's going to ensure that you don't miss any angularity in your soft foot. So if 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 you have any angularity, it's going to be different uh, in say the front to to the back or the inside to the outside of that foot. Um, what might measure is six thousandths on the outside, might be nine on the inside. Um, and if we don't recognize that, you're just going to be expounding on whatever existing soft foot you, you currently have. The dial indicator, this is something we talked about second. Um, this is going to give you quick visible information. Um, you can set up multiple indicators uh, on multiple feet and multiple planes. Uh, so this will give you a bit more information. Uh, it's a little more sophisticated than the gauges, but your outcome should be the same. Uh, whether you use one versus the other usually comes down to preference. Um, sometimes if the feeler gauges aren't giving you the information you want, you, you want to throw some dials on there, that's fine too. Um, it's a good way to troubleshoot. Uh, the difference when using a dial indicator is we're measuring relatively. Um, we need a starting point when we're doing something like that. So in this case, um, you're going to need to start this method with all bolts tightened as opposed to the feeler gauges where everything's loose. Um, and with all bolts tightened, place your plunger on the first foot you'll be measuring and set your dial to zero. All right, these, the outer rim of that case um, can be spun to calibrate kind of like, uh, like a scale, like, a, like your bathroom scale. Um, you can begin by loosening your bolt until it's free of the frame resistance. Um, however much your dial reads is how, for, how far your foot moved. Um, 
then you can retighten and move on to the rest of the feet. Um, these these dial indicators are also uh, extremely helpful when you're looking for the outside sources like pipe stream. Um, you can put them all over the machine if you want to see how it moves. Um, finally, uh, the laser system. Uh, these are a little more sophisticated, but ultimately easier to use. Um, you can measure single or dual plane depending on the system. Um, the difference is the measurement um, is the movement of the shaft and not so much the feet. So there's uh, you know some advanced mathematical formula that I don't know how to explain that takes the information at the at the coupling and translates it to the feet. Um, usually it will walk you through the process and includes an auto diagnosis. Um, so I include this method separately uh, since we all have our alliances when it comes to the laser systems. Um, of course, mine rests with the Rotoline Touch from Proof Technic, which walks you through the soft foot measurement and a following diagnosis screen by screen. Um, like I said, it's it's it is important to remember that that these are measuring movement at the shaft and not the feet. Um, so if the movement is in excess of the two thousandths, uh, we use our soft foot tolerance. Uh, it provide it proceeds to give directions uh, on how to fix the condition. So it gives you kind of like a like a wizard, like a wizard application to to diagnose each foot individually as it takes readings. So now that we've learned about soft foot, we understand the effects, what causes it, why it's important, um, how to measure it. Now it's time to figure out how we how do we fix it. Okay. So the first thing I have to I have to throw out here is a warning. Um, there's a few things I believe to be important to remember when going into alignment with soft foot. Um, first thing to realize is that two thirds of all rotating machinery have soft foot. You will have to deal with this. Whether you choose to is up to you, um, but it is there. This isn't just this isn't a myth. This is the real real deal. Okay. Secondly, uh, diagnosing and correcting it is is time consuming. Um, it, it will probably take more time than the alignment itself. Um, this is okay. It should be considered part of the full job. Um, it will be frustrating from loosening to tightening bolts a few times um, to trying to slide feeler gauges under feet when you're wearing work gloves. There's a lot of minor annoyances that will add up, um, but it's paramount to expect all these things going forward. Okay, if you've never taken care of soft foot before, and are looking to incorporate this to your future alignment work, I need you to think back to this and remember to remain calm and think critically. At the risk of sounding wildly dramatic and over the top, this practice will pay off in dividends when it comes to alignment and diagnosing soft foot. It's easy to reach your boiling point when it feels like you're wasting time, but I assure you, you're not. This is all part of the deal, okay? The more attention you pay to soft foot, the less alignments you will have to do. It's a simple, it's a simple equation. Um, I think anyone here with experience can attest to that. Um, and I think it's really important to know that, you know, if anyone's ever had to strip wallpaper, you don't ever want to do it again, but it pays off. It's the same type of deal. Our preliminary actions going forward, this is this is mostly some housekeeping stuff here. Um, this is about being clean. This is about eliminating squishy when you can. All right. So before we correct the soft foot with our shims, you want to ensure that all the surfaces are free of dirt and debris. I can't stress this enough because it really just throws crazy variables into your entire process. Um, in most cases, you'll start a job on a machine that's already shimmed. Something that I like to do before starting. Um, if I'm not throwing brand new shims in there, uh, I like to pull out the already existing shims and clean them as well as possible. So that's when we go back to our, you know, our brake cleaner and rags. Um, if, if I'm not able to use new stuff, I try to bring the old stuff back as best I can. Um, if you've eliminated the corrosion, paint, grime, etc., anything that accumulates over time, you're also eliminating the possibility of creating a new squishy foot condition during your alignment. It's just important to be clean. We talked about shim rules earlier, um, and there are a few, and it might seem like a lot, but it's not. 
Um, along with using the clean shims, there's some rules like these. Um, all this does is prevent you from creating your own squishy foot. So the first rule, pretty easy to keep in your pocket since it makes sense visually. Um, you'll want a shim big enough to cover the footprint of the machine. Shims come in various sizes, um, so there's not really an excuse here. When it comes to like really massive machinery, shims are typically fabricated on site. Um, whether or not that's your responsibility, I'm not sure, um, but it is, it is something that does happen. Uh, most sources will point to an 80% coverage rate, um, but like we said before, there's not really a reason to not cover the entire foot. Um, you'll want to use four shims or less under each foot. Shims come in various sizes for a reason, um, and by that I mean thicknesses. So, I mean, think of it, if you have eight shims stacked together, you're, you're making that spring that we talked about. So if you put a spring under a foot, that's a squishy foot. You're going to want to sandwich um, your thinnest shims in between your thickest shims. This not only makes it easier on you um, for placing them, but it also eliminates um, any any sort of uh, shim creasing that may occur. Um, anyone that's ever slid shims underneath a machine knows that sometimes if you if you have really really thin ones, they fold up like uh, like printer paper underneath a shim or underneath a foot. If you have to stack shims, which is highly probable, be sure to verify it's the thickness you need. That's where the micrometer comes into play. So if you're using a micrometer, you measure the stack, you check to see if everything adds up. Um, as with everything that we use in day-to-day -day life, sometimes there's going to be manufacturing errors or defects, um, and it's, it's, it's vital to check for that. So what we're doing is, say we have uh, that stack there, which should be 39, and then it gets measured and it's closer to 33 thousandths. That could, that could make or break your alignment. Um, this rule also applies to any shim over 30 thousandths. So um, if it's a thicker shim, use your calipers to verify that it's actually what it says it is. Uh, some sources will say 20 thousandths, some say 60. Uh, whatever limit you wanna make for yourself, that's up to you. I like to take right in the middle of the road there because that's a pretty big difference um, and say 30 thousandths. If you have any shims that are over 30 thousandths, verify them to make sure they're actually 30 thousandths or more, whatever they should be. Um, it seems like it could be a lot to remember, but this is all part of that thinking critically uh, mindset I mentioned earlier. Um, and if, as long as you keep, keep all this stuff in your pocket, it, it's pretty visual. Um, you don't have to remember any lists. You should be able to remember this when you're looking at your shims. Um, once you have this kind of under your hat, you're setting yourself up for success um, as far as correcting. So moving forward, um, we talked about the types of soft foot, but what does that look like? Okay. So there's two, there's two types of, of conditions, uh, so to speak. Uh, one is diagonal and one is uh, single. So diagonal is going to be, um, uh, it's when the two feet uh, are diagonal to one another. Those are going to have parallel. Uh, this is usually caused by a uh, short foot or two, two of the corresponding feet don't exist on the same plane. Um, and like I said, this is where you'll, you'll see most likely your parallel soft foot, which is a little easier. You just figure out your gap and shim it. Uh, when you detect a singular, singular soft foot, um, you can pretty much guarantee it's going to be angular. Um, a condition like this manifests itself from a warp or bend somewhere, whether it be the machine, uh, the frame, or the case. When fixing your uh, diagonal soft foot, um, where the two feet are not parallel, you'll first want to make sure... Uh, the bolts on the opposite feet are tightened completely. Uh, so the ones that we're not fixing, those need to be down all the way. Uh, but once they are, you're good to shim them um, and fill the gap. Well, after you've shimmed it, leave the bolts loose um, and verify that no gap remains. That's when you take your feeler gauge back out um, and try to slide uh, anything bigger than a two thousandths uh, wedge underneath. Um, if you can, 
you add the required millage and verify again. Um, you might not get it on the first try, and that's okay. Like I said, this this uh, this can take a while, or it cannot. Uh, it's just like anything, any job you ever have to do. Moving on to the single saw foot, um, this is a bit more difficult. Okay, this is this is why it's important to measure around the entire foot with your gauges, like we talked about earlier. Um, and this will typically be an angled saw foot. Now we know you can fill a parallel gap with flat shims, but what if you need to fill a wedge space? Once you determine the angular gap from inside the foot to the outside, uh, you want to create a step pattern with your shims like you see uh, on the screen here. This will take some finesse. Um, it also requires a little bit of that patience we spoke about earlier. Um, if you find that there is more than a 20 thousandths variance um, in the angularity, from side to side, uh, you, you need to machine that. You need to machine that foot, and you need to machine that base. Um, I've used some pretty beefy shims here in the example um, to illustrate the setup. Yours are going to be a lot more subtle. Um, if the angle's too drastic, the shims are going to work their way out over time during operation. Um, and if the foot and base must be machined, uh, now is the time to remain calm. Okay. Uh, this is your best practice, and I just skipped around here. Sorry about that. Um, if it does have to be pulled and machined, uh, you're doing the right thing, and know that going forward. Uh, once everything has been, all the gaps have been filled correctly, um, in the more common event uh, that you're able to shim it, uh, it'll be time to tighten the bolts and begin your precision alignment. Uh, whether you're using lasers, dial indicators, what have you. Hopefully not a straight edge, but that's a that's a discussion for another day. Um, it's vital that the bolts are tightened in a star pattern gradually, um, like like a vehicle tire. Um, this is this is a common torque pattern. This shouldn't be anything new to you guys. Um, you'll want to make a few passes here in a sequence uh, similar to what I've laid out. Uh, it doesn't have to be exact. Just make sure... Um, you're not going around clockwise or counterclockwise, um, just as long as you crisscross. Um, we all know that if you just go in a circle, tightening these bolts, um, maybe even one at a time, you, you run the risk of moving the machine and kind of giving it a drift. Um, so, yeah, I think that pretty much covers the whole process. I think we can now move on to the second poll question here. Um, you know, if you rarely or don't ever check for soft foot, like we talked about earlier, how often are you able to finish a machine alignment to tolerance? Um, hopefully you're using some precision methods. Um, are you always, are you always able to finish it? Are you able to finish it most of the time? Um, rarely or almost never. Um, you might have some some pretty horrific conditions, and that's okay. Um, these are, this is why we're here to talk about it. All right. Well, the polls are open, and uh, can you let us know if you don't check for selfhood or rarely do so, how often are you able to align the machine to tolerance? All right. So one final question here. And we'll let it, all of our listeners weigh in. And again, um, after the presentation, we'll be opening up the floor for Q&A. So please go ahead and type your questions at any time in the question feature. And we'll ask Ryan to answer them. All right, looks like we've got most of the votes in. So let's go ahead and share results with our listeners. 10% are saying, always. Ryan, 54% over half say most of the time. 16% mm -hmm. rarely and 20% almost never. So about a third say rarely or almost never over half most of the time. Oh, yeah, this is this is actually interesting. I, I didn't expect these numbers to be the way they are. Um, so it's a bit of a learning experience for me. Um, the people um, that voted for most of the time, I'd be interested to hear 
how often you have to do these alignments um, just because uh, these things can get knocked out of out of alignment pretty easily um, depending on how many factors are present um, so kudos uh, to everybody that's able to always align to tolerance um, and I, I guess almost never and, and the rarely crowd we can kind of talk to how important this this might be going forward um, and most of the time I'd be interested to hear, you know, how often you have to do these these jobs, um, and how often uh, the installs are. Uh, but if 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 we don't get to talk to you um, today after this, do not hesitate to uh, to send me an email. Ryan.best at prooftechnic.com. You can also get me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm on there. That's easy to get in touch with. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a bit more casual. Um, so if you don't feel comfortable um, and you'd rather ask in a more private forum, go for it. I'm available. Great. All right. Well, we appreciate that, Ryan. And um, we're going to open up the floor now for uh, for questions. And uh, one listener has asked, what size motors or pumps really benefit from this? And the reason for his question is he feels with the newer coupling technologies, being more forgiven these days on smaller motor pump sets. So, you know, do you have a a certain type of motor where you feel soft foot is more prone to soft foot? Soft foot's prone uh, to everything. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't employ this on stuff like servo motors. Um, but when it comes down to uh, our machine alignment, a lot of people go right to the coupling. They want to talk about the tolerance of the t of the coupling. And all the, the wear and tear that they'll, you know, endure over time. But when it comes down to alignment, and this is, you know, this is kind of like one of my Ten Commandments. I'm not here to protect your coupling. I'm here to protect your machinery. Um, when we talk about tolerances, your machinery tolerances are going to be considerably higher uh, than your coupling. So if you're running misaligned, um, whether it's soft foot or any other, you know, uh, reason we talked about earlier. You can you can replace that that flex seal, you know every every six months if you want, but just know that if, if you are, you're probably beating your bearings up pretty bad, and once that happens, that motor has to get pulled. Um, you've got way more downtime than you already anticipated. Then you're then you definitely have to check for soft foot, so so on and so forth. So it's in conclusion, I'd say every every motor it's worth checking. It doesn't take long to check. Um, you know, the main the main meat of the process is is throwing the shims in there. And you know, if you have something that's angular, that can that can be a headache. But you know, you, it's something you have to do as long as you remain calm. Okay. Um, I know Ryan. You know that we've say that this is. Uh, try to keep this product agnostic, these webinars, but we did have a listener ask about uh, one of the Proof Technic products, the Vibe Expert, and how that is employed for detection. Um, can you share some insights on how that might be utilized for software conditions? Yeah, so the Vibe Expert is a, a handheld um, data collector for vibration. Um, you can also use it for other things like balancing um, and modal ODS. Um, but with that said, a lot of places will employ um, route collection or troubleshooting for vibration analysis on their machinery. Um, so if we're talking about, you know, the motor we, we were just talking about where the, the coupling, uh, the seal needs to get replaced every six months. Uh, some places are going to use a Vibe Expert um, to do some sort of troubleshooting or hire a service department to come in and, and kind of figure out what's going on with the vibration here. Um, and then from there, you know, the data is extrapolated, um, thrown in the software, and an analysis can be taken to see, you know, at a glance, uh, what's going on, and then can get dived into a little bit deeper when um, the spectrum is looked at. So that can that can come down to early early bearing detection, um, misalignment, looseness, a whole plethora of information. Cool. We've also had a listener ask, um, 
why does soft foot cause bearing damage at the top and the bottom of the bearing brace? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so the way the way soft foot replicates itself in the rotation is anything that's going it, to, it's, it's going to impact 180 degrees. Um, so uh, think of it as, as something that's bouncing up and down as it's spinning. That's kind of the best way I can I can explain it. Um, but if it if if it's spinning and impacting at the same at the at the harmonic of the of the one x frequency, it's going to hit top and bottom every rotation, which is which is just an impact of, at the top and bottom. Gotcha. And does a soft foot condition tend to happen all at once, or is it something that you know develops gradually over time? or perhaps both? Uh, it's, it's both. So depending on, you know, which kind it is, um, you know, you're going to have the parallel. Com like we were talking about with the shims, not everything's machined perfectly. Um, if you're using like a fabricated base, those things aren't going to be perfect as, as, much as, as much as you want them to be. They probably won't be. And that's okay because it's not possible to do it. Um, that's going to give you soft foot. As soon as you loosen one of those bolts, to do this, you're going to knock a bunch of junk free, and that's going to create millage uneven in between shims, and that's going to give you soft foot too. So soft foot, soft foot can happen um, at any time, um, but it's just if, if you have that machine off and you're doing your alignment, that's when you need to check for it. That's part of the entire process. Okay. And you mentioned... Um... You know, shims is part of uh, the solution. And do you have particular types of shims that you recommend? Um, one listener asked about a soft shoe shim. You know, are there, do you have specific recommendations? And also, do you recommend that you continue to reuse shims or replace? Maybe you can speak to both of those. Sure. So for the first one, um, there is there is a lot of different kinds of shims. Um, Depending on the machinery, some things may have like an OEM specification. Um, if something needs to be dampened, you know, if, if there's some sort of resonance, sometimes you'll throw some some different things in there, like a like a rubber shim. Um, at one point, there was something called plastic age, which was essentially just like a block of cheese that you would kind of cut your your shims off to size, um, and it was it was like a plastic fill. Um, typically most common is just going to be steel shims um, and they they run the gamut um, they can be as, as you know as small as uh, you know uh, a silver dollar all the way up to you know the size of my head um, and when it comes to, to using shims I don't like being wasteful um, if you pull a shim and you clean it and you still have you know corrosion and millage on there because sometimes that stuff can can really stick to it. Uh, I'd say toss it, replace it. You know, your your conditions are going to be different. That millage is going to be different when you throw it in there. Um, but at least you're starting off somewhere clean, and you're not inducing more error. So it's it's mostly that's a judgment call, and that's that's when you need to start critically thinking as well. Excellent. You also mentioned that the shims that you showed in your example were thicker than you might typically use. Is there a certain um, maximum threshold for thickness of shims that you recommend? Um, I mean, if you, if you're doing if you're doing a vertical shim that's you know probably over seventy five thousandths. I mean, it all depends on the machine size too. Once it gets to be a ridiculous amount, you know, then you got to really start thinking what's what's actually wrong here. Um, if if you can't get that thing shimmed properly with four shims because it's too much, um, it's it's time to start looking at the base and figuring out what's going on there. Okay, well taken. And uh, one listener is asking about the correlation between RPM and being more prone to soft foot and specifically asked if machines above 3600 rpm tend to be more sensitive to soft foot can you uh, share any insights on 
Uh, typically, stuff that goes faster than that um, is going to be more susceptible to just about everything. Um, the higher the speed, the tighter the tolerance of the machines for their alignment. Um, so I don't know how much more susceptible they would be um, to a direct correlation to speed. I don't know if that's an actual, I don't know if that's that's a formula that exists. Um, the the takeaway is that it, it does exist, um, that, that software will exist. Um, and I'm not sure if there is uh, a correlation to how much it affects it based on speed. Uh, that might be my inexperience or it might just not exist. Um, but with that said, um, the faster machines are going to are going to require a lot more precision. Um, and most of the time, they're not going to have the same types of bearings either. They're not going to have. Uh, uh, they're going to usually have sleeve bearings or journal bearings, which gives you a different different set of rules on the inside there. Gotcha. And now one listener is asking, is it necessary to have the motor coupled in order to check for softwood? Sometimes it, sometimes it, uh, it can't be. Um, I always like to do alignments coupled, um, but sometimes you can't. Sometimes it's, you know, attached to a gearbox or if you're doing an alignment, there's a, there's a piece missing. Um, all you're doing is essentially checking that there's contact with the feet to the base. Um, that's going to that's gonna kind of fall into external force. Um, but for me, best practice, always have them coupled. Okay. And you alluded to uh, a few of the causes for soft foot early in the presentation. But can you maybe reiterate what are the most common causes during normal operation that can cause soft foot? Um, and not, not so much drastic changes, you know, like um, bringing up, bringing online new equipment. But during normal operations, what do you see most frequently as the cause? Uh, just vibration. Um, at that point, once it's once it's down, it's down. If it has soft foot in the beginning, it's going to have it the whole way. Um, the only thing that can really occur, in my mind, um, during operation, would be vibration knocking a shim out. Mm. Okay. And then from there, you know, you're missing, you're miss, you're creating a, a, a new gap. Gotcha. And realistically, or as a, you know, Ryan, um, how often do you feel is best practice to check for soft foot? Uh, checking for soft foot is is vital to a successful um, alignment job. So anytime you ever have to do a machine alignment. Checking for soft foot uh, shouldn't be optional. That's my philosophy. Um, I understand that things happen. Sometimes you don't have time. Um, sometimes you, you just have to get the job done. You end up chasing your tail. Um, but I will say this. If you don't eliminate that and then you try to do your precision alignment, um, you're just going to end up chasing your tail because nothing, nothing's going to sit the same way. So when we do our alignments, we, you know, we do maybe a sweep measurement, um, verify that it repeats. Uh, it gives us what we need to do at the feet in order to make those two machines meet where they need to at the coupling properly. Um, you shim it the way you should, the way it's telling you to, the way your math works out, and then you do another sweep, and there's a whole new problem. It doesn't make any sense. Um, these, things, these things aren't static uh, when, when you have a soft foot problem. So it's, in my mind, it's necessary every time. Okay. And again, Ryan, I know we were steering, you know, clear of specific products, but people were asking about, um, you know, since Technic and Fluke also offer monitoring equipment. Um, so is there a particular monitor that might be able to um, tell a user when softwood needs to be checked? Yeah, there's a couple different solutions for that. Um, you can have a continuous monitoring solution, um, something like a VibGuard. Um, a lot of a lot of places uh, are going in the way of um, like a solution as a service. 
um, where you can put a, a wireless sensor, which Fluke offers on top of uh, on top of your assets that talks to um, some software that you can monitor all the time as well. Um, it's a little easier to use uh, if you don't have a lot of vibration analysis experience. That might be the solution. Um, if you have some really critical stuff, uh, the VibGuard might be the way to go, uh, just because it's going to give you a plethora of information, um, sometimes more than you need. Um, but it's always good to have um, it's always good to have more info, as far as I'm concerned. Um, a lot of times, companies will hire outside service guys or implement uh, a monthly route collection on site. Um, that's when we that's when we talk about our handheld devices, like the Vibe Expert earlier. Um, you set up uh, a string of all your machines, and then you go uh, eat up to each one, take readings at the bearings, um, upload your data, and do analysis that way as well. I think the next big step for everybody is going to be AI. Um, it's it's already it's already well underway, um, but that, that's a that's a conversation for another time, I believe. Right. And it sounds like, you know, just from these questions, we've, we've now gotten some ideas for several future uh, webinar presentations. Um, maybe you can share, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, you mentioned the 0.002 tolerance being a standard. Um, so can you, and you mentioned, where do you go to find out more information about what are the standards, right, that we should be, um, that we should be aligning ourselves with. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, a lot of the stuff that I talked about with Softfoot, um, kind of up for debate. My big go-to um, is the Shaft Alignment Handbook by a man called John Petrowski, um, which is readily available um, in PDF form. You can also buy um, uh, physical copies of it. Um, that's got everything you'll ever want to know. Um, he's a big fan of reverse dial indicator. Um, so there's going to be a lot of info there. Um, but that's that's kind of the Bible. Um, and as far as um, alignment tolerances, uh, when we talk about, you know, RPM, um, the different coupling types, et cetera, and so forth, um, there's an industry standard that we all use as well. Um, you know, it's it's in all of all of our books it's in all of our manuals so um i don't have a direct link of where to find that that chart uh, but if you were to just google uh, shaft alignment tolerances uh, you'd have a chart so it's a little different based on flex coupling versus spacer coupling versus you know universal joint coupling um, and then kind of multiplied by speed uh, to a tighten tighten state um, but like I said, if any of you have any questions about any of that stuff, um, I can I can definitely point you in the right directions uh, personally. Um, so email or LinkedIn, and I'd be more than happy to go further with it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Ryan. Um, and I want to be respectful of time here. We, uh, and thanks to our listeners for all of your questions. And we tried to address as many as we could, but uh, Ryan has generously um, offered to um, get you answers if we didn't get to your question during the presentation. And again, uh, we will be sharing at the conclusion a brief survey. And um, now that we have people with this depth of knowledge, such as Ryan and others, on the team, we want to be sure that we're presenting topics that really can uh, be of most benefit to you. So please take a moment and ask and respond to that survey and let us know other topics that we can present. And also during the survey, you can request a copy of the slides of Ryan's presentation. Um, so again, thank you to Ryan and Proof Technic for you know assembling this presentation and. Thanks to all of our listeners today for taking time to join us and to the whole Fluke Reliability team. Um, as I said, I learned so much on all of these webinars. And uh, so have a great day. And thank you, Ryan. This was really extremely helpful. And uh, hopefully our listeners will continue the dialogue. Okay. And we appreciate you generously sharing all your expertise and Thanks to our listeners for your interactivity and um, 
that will do it for today. So we'll see you all the next time. And uh, thank you again. Take care.